the pulse was well as as uh, my guitarist Mark Stewart put it uh, it's a bunch of very good friends who happen to make music a, a great group and a lot of camaraderie overall it was more like a family than than a, a, a business venture or or a, a, a bunch of friends getting together it just it, it just felt like it was more than that to me it truly is a band of brothers I didn't even know 21 megapixels existed. Yeah, yeah. it's a uh, really nice camera. Yeah. 21 megapixels, he's focused. <laughs> Look how focused he is. John's focused too. Oh, that's ugly. That's, that's just, that's just ugly. ugly. George's yeah, just, work, he's just like, yeah, whatever. It's yeah, all good, man. To tell you. Yeah, just another day. Yeah. Well, we do that one too. So I can set one of mine up on a tripod <laughs> and just hook it up to my laptop. Your camera or your beer? Camera. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my beer's always on a tripod. <laughs> is he, is this it? Is this yeah, I just saw him, he was just standing there. What's up, old boy? <laughs> oh, you sound good. <laughs> That's why I kept away from you for a while. What's that? Oh, that was a handshake. A handshake? Oh, uh, no, he hands. said he was going to kiss you. I know. Oh I man, my teeth. Yeah, you must have done something wrong, he's bad. <laughs> well, the Pulse was like an iteration of uh, a band that um, we started uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, literally, um, uh, I knew a guy from college who uh, was a drummer but didn't have a drum kit. So he literally had one of those electronic drum pads. and. Uh, he'd come over to my house with my younger brother Joe who knew a few chords on the guitar and uh, we'd drink beer and try to make our way through the, the songs of the times, you know, the popular songs and uh, uh, we got, I mean, we, we were horrible. Let's face it, we were horrible. The name of the band was The Neurotics. Um, uh, it was, it was literally because nobody else wanted to do it. Um, and probably the first three, four years, I, I constantly nervous that somebody would figure out that I couldn't sing. I just couldn't do it, you know. And I was just out there, just just doing it, you know. And it, you know, you, you, your friends and your family come see you play and everything. Man, you're great, you're great. I'm like, yeah. Well, you kind of have to say that because you're my family, and my friends. But you know, I, I'm just not that good. I'm just not that good. I felt extremely lucky because I was surrounded by people who, who could sing, um, who could carry harmonies and stuff, and they just make me, made me look a lot better uh, than I actually felt. Um, so, but you know, as I progressed, um, I got more familiar with the music and what my voice could do, I got to a point where it was like, I'm pretty comfortable. I picked up the acoustic guitar when I was 14, and my brother taught me some stuff, maybe, maybe 13. Um, my brother taught me a couple of chords. House of the Rising Sun was the first song that I learned to play. And of course, the uh, dun, 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 of Smoke on the Water, right? That's the beginning riff that every beginning guitar player learns. Uh, and I just played all the way through, um, all the way through college. And the first time I actually really was part of a band was when the Pulse first got together. And that I had to learn how to play completely differently. I started playing when I was a little kid, uh, playing guitar. Then in school I picked up trumpet but didn't like that, so I took up the saxophone. Um, and I did well on the saxophone, so when I was in the last year of elementary school, I got called over to the middle school to play in the jazz band there. Uh, and the jazz band had a guitar player that was really good. He was a year older than me, a friend of mine. Um, so, uh, I asked him to join me and play guitar at my sister's wedding. Uh, so, we are like 12, 13 years old, my sister's getting married, we played the guitars at her wedding, and then it was about a month after that, his parents came by to talk to my parents and said, oh, Daryl's in this band, uh, they have two guitar players and a drummer, but they need a bass player. Would, would Ron be interested in learning to play bass? So. Uh, I said, of course, you know, sure, they, they bought me a bass and an amp, uh, hooked me up with some lessons, and probably six months later, I, I joined my first band at like, I don't know, I think I was 13 or 14. 
beginning of drumming kind of went back to the early 70s. Uh, my neighbor had a drum kit in his uh, bedroom downstairs and we go hang out and I got kind of uh, 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 liking the drums. So I bought my first drum kit in 1977 and just started working with high school buddies and and everywhere I moved when I progressed and lived out and my drums went with me and otherwise I would have just been a bedroom drummer. <laughs> I may go back to that too, but... <laughs> well, the Pulse had a couple of different iterations. Um, in the earliest days, they, uh, it was uh, John Fountain and Kurt Crosby played bass. Uh, Howard Friedenberg played drums. Tim Foley played guitar. I played guitar. And that iteration lasted, I think, until somewhere in the early 90s. Uh, since nobody really wanted to sing, um, I was kind of thrown in there. Um, and I, th I think that went on for maybe a, a year or two, and then Kurt just got too busy. Um, and then sort of phase two of the Pulse showed up. Uh, and that, that was sheer happenstance. We, we disbanded. Um, but we're still friends. So the guitarist that he knew from high school, Mark Stewart, um, called me up like six months later and said, hey, I was walking down the street and I heard somebody playing drums. When I moved, first moved to Fremont, um, I had a drum kit up in my second bedroom in my house and Mark Stewart, the lead guitarist, lived about three houses down and one day came by, was walking by and heard me play and then we were converging at our neighbor's house, a third party, to, to have a uh, discussion. And so Mark and I were at our neighbor's house talking and he says, yeah, I heard some drums. And I said, well, I play the drums. And he goes, well, I play in a band. So he was in a former band. And we thought we'd just get together one day and jam. So, you know, I packed my drums up and walked down three houses. And he was already connected with John Fountain. At the time, you know, we were put together. We, now we had a guitarist, Mark. We had George on the drums, and, and then me trying to sing. Um, uh, so then Mark's uh, wife, also taking the exercise class, uh, runs into this other lady who happens to know somebody who, who's a bass player. Uh, and his name was Ron Logan. Um, so we brought Ron in, uh, and then we kind of had a, a kind of a loose group there. Um, so we played around, played a few bar gigs, uh, had a great time. And we had a guy named Larry who was on keyboards, which really wasn't a keyboardist. He just kind of pounded on the keys. It was a great run. Loved playing with Ron Logan. Just a, a, a really great guy and a great bass player. Uh, Ron um, kind of wanted to move on. Ron Logan, the bass player. So we then were on the hunt for a bass player. So I, I talked to Kurt Crosby again, who was working for Sun Microsystems at the time. I said, hey, you guys have a message board at Sun. Can I put up an, a, a, an ad for uh, a, a guitar player and a bass player? We stumbled along Fred. You know, Fred, Fred came along and uh, he was a great bass player. He was a great bass player. And it was just kind of, it kind of melded right there at that point. At that point, you know, because it, he also carried great harmonies and it was, it was awesome. That worked out. We, we started getting some songs together and, you know, the, the, the grooves started going. Fred was playing bass at the time. We come to find out that, yeah, Fred was a great bass player, but he was an excellent guitar player. I, I looked at him and said, you play bass like a guitar player, and that's what he came clean. He, in fact, in order to answer the ad, taught himself how to play bass. So he was great, but he was playing like a guitar player, and boy, he picked up the guitar, and we clicked immediately. So then we're like, well, we need a bass player now, right? Because we're gonna move Fred up into the guitar thing. I was also playing in my church in Livermore on Sundays, and that's where I met this guy, Ron Tripp. Uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in coming to play bass with his, uh, with his band outside of church, and I said, sure went over and we, we had a practice at George's house at the time and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> and what Ron added not only was years of, of playing in bands, but he had a really great high voice. So he could hit that, that fifth, that high harmony. And man, that's when it really, really locked in. Our harmonies were badass. They really were. And, and uh, the, the Beatles tune we did in the studio, uh, I want to tell you, the, the harmonies on that were freaking great. 
And so we kind of collated, uh, put these this group together and started practicing and started enjoying it. And that was the kind of the formation, probably 1991 or 92 uh, of the Pults. You know, with the George, uh, Ron Tripp, Fred Rouse, uh, Mark Stewart, and myself. Um, so that's how it kind of came together. But it took six or seven years to get to that point. We connected and uh, really that, uh, you know, what it was was a group of uh, well, actually great guys, great people that just really had a passion for music that got along well. There were no egos. And we really devoted, you know, our time uh, to practice and practicing and uh, we just had fun. You know, we got along well. Once we had the glue, once we knew we had something, uh, then we, we more or less formalized it. We put together uh, uh, scheduled rehearsals. And it started really in Mark's garage. We would always practice in his garage once a week, religiously on Wednesdays. Before a gig, sometimes it was twice a week. It was a release for all of us. We always got together, always had fun, um, and we really got connected to each other musically. And, and it was just a blessing how everyone listened to each other. You know, it was just rehearsing. And for, for, you know, initially when I joined a band, of course, for the first several months, it's just me learning the stuff they already play, right? Uh, and of course for them, it's, it's just rehearsal. They're, they're keeping, keeping their chops up or, you know, staying on top of the stuff. But for me, it was learning a lot of it. And the funny thing was, it was like, um, I did almost none of their songs were songs that I listened to on the radio. So rather than having an understanding of what the bass parts were like in, in most of the songs they were doing, um, I had no idea what the actual bass part was like on the record. So I, I really wasn't duplicate, I wasn't replicating what somebody else recorded on a, on a previous recording. It was, it was what I thought the, the song needed for a bass part. We rarely had any arguments. We may have had some civil disagreements, you know, polite disagreements, but we never really like, people were slamming their guitars down and people screaming at each other. Uh, so it was very amicable, collaborative, you know, uh, group. Um, so the fact that we were able to endure that long and be on the same page and uh, actually execute, um, I think was, for that amount of time, I think for, you know, garage band was pretty significant. Uh, I had a band where the, the lead, I toured with this band and the lead singer and I got into a fist fight. Uh, I, I played in band where the drummer and I almost got into a fist fight. You know, most, most bands are torn apart by egos, so. <laughs> I don't think we ever really had any, any major arguments about anything. It was, and, and I think that's what it made so special because people were so supportive off stage and on stage. You know, you always knew somebody had your back. You forgot a lyric, somebody would fill in for you. Uh, somebody dropped a, a note or two, somebody was there to back it up. So it was, uh, it was magic, it really was. There are days when nobody in the band can do anything wrong. Everything we do just locks and you're in a groove. And the analogy I like to use, if I was playing basketball, I'd just dribble a little ways past half court, toss it up and then turn around and run back to the other end because I know it's going in, you know? And, and there's days when everybody in the band is in that same pocket and it's just, you, we can't do anything wrong. Those are the days when the solos are a little longer and a little more energetic and I'm reaching for stuff I wouldn't normally reach for because, you know, I'm feeling like, ah, but I can get it this time, you know? Uh, and, and those are great. Those, those shows are great. And then there's other times where it's just the opposite of that. It was never just the band members because it was always the wives, the kids. It was a bunch of us and the wives all got along. Um, it, it just was a fantastic mix. I mean, we had uh, regular holiday dinners. Uh, we'd get together. Um, yeah, we'd get together and, and sometimes we'd just talk more than we would play music. It's just like, hey, you know, what's going on in your life and stuff? And we'd just sit and chat. Um, we had regular sessions where it was just like, hey, 
let's listen to these songs. I think that overall, we all had a sense of humor. So, you know, it was, it was fun. It was always fun. You know, Fred Rouse was a, was a jokester and, and he had a very dry sense of humor, as did Mark and John. So we all, we all got along. So It must have been the 80s and 90s. Uh, it was pretty trendy if you were having a big party or a big event to that you've got a lot of tables and people who are sitting out there, you'd put these disposable cameras on all the tables. And the idea is people, you'll, you've got a whole room full of photographers now. Everybody's gonna pick these cameras up and take pictures of all the people at their table and each other. And then they, they throw these things in a pile and get them developed. And, and now they've got all these pictures that everybody took of their party. Uh, and and it, if, if we were playing someplace that had one of those, Fred would always grab the camera and go in the bathroom and take a picture of his ass. It was a pretty mischievous group of guys. So there was a couple of pranks that we would, the stories that we would tell, but the, the, one of the most fun things to do was just before we would do a, a song, um, we would whisper an alternate lyric into John, right? So, um, I don't remember who the uh, the band was that did Better Man, and it was uh, something. It must be a better man. We we would sing, "Pass me the butter man." So that when John came up to it, he's got two things running in his head, and he would give us that dirty look of, "You guys are killing me," and we used to do that kind of stuff all the time. Uh, which made it really, really fun. And I think people saw that we were having a lot of fun playing together. And that made a big difference. Uh, it was a very democratic uh, band. Some people would bring in songs that they wanted to do. Some were yeah, current songs, uh, some were older songs. Most of the songs were brought in by John, Mark and Fred, uh, and most of them were really good songs. Uh, I said they were democratic. Anybody could bring in a song, but anybody could veto it. Anybody could say, no, I don't like to do that. And it just took one vote, and it was like, okay, we're out. We had a process by which we would take a new song, you know, something that we had heard, and we would work with it. We would try to play it. We'd try to find our version of it. And after about two to three months, excuse me for saying it this way, but we would say, we, we would kind of look up and say, we're trying to polish a turd here. You know, no matter how much we work on this, it's still going to be a turd. And let's just walk away and look for something new. Uh, and everybody brought their own styles into it. It was like the most, what was the most popular? Um, we, we did a lot of Counting Crows. Um, and you have to excuse me, the names are escaping me. Um, but yeah, there were, there were some definite songs where people would just get up and, and, and go. Mr. Jones. People loved that song. Uh, so we played it, and we played it to death. Um, because it was after a while, I was like, hey, I just can't do this anymore. I just can't do this song. There was a couple of things that drove where we went with the music. And actually, the, the songs that we did play from the 80s and 90s were great stuff. But, you know, Mark wasn't a, a classic heavy rock guy. And John um, liked the newer genre of music. So when you have, you know, the influence of the lead singer and the lead guitarist, I think others will follow, uh, and Fred, I don't know that Fred even was into, so they were more into country, rock, and so, and Fred was heavily into the Beatles, which we did some of those, so it was just at some point just realized that, you know, if it wasn't kind of in the DNA of the band to want to do that, it was harder to do. George, the drummer, uh, tended to uh, uh, lean towards the blues. I had a... a a preference for heavy metal, heavy you know, rock, R&B, and this band wasn't necessarily doing that. So I was always wanting to infuse and bring in that that style and genre of music. Uh, Mark liked more of the classic rock, the Eagles. Uh, Fred was game for anything, um, as was Ron. If anybody, for any reason, thought of playing a country song, there's absolutely no way I would have wanted to play that. You know. Uh, I, don't, I don't listen to country music. I, I don't enjoy playing it. It offers me no challenge whatsoever. It's just, I, 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 I don't get me started. <laughs> and I think Ron Tripp kind of helped support 
uh, moving the band's music into a slightly more edgy area. Not that Ron Logan couldn't or didn't, but uh, Ron's background was more in that ACDC classic metal rock that kind of at that point kind of felt like I had somebody else that was kind of in, the, in alignment with the type of stuff I wanted to do. Once you realize you're worth a bunch of musicians and who uh, can mostly play by ear, uh, and you bring in a song and they do, do, they listen to it, they listen to it, they'll listen to it two or three times and like, okay, I got it, let's go. Yeah, it, it was exciting, it was fun. Um, so, uh, it's the original question, it's just like, as, as, as we progressed through the years, I, I knew what I could do, uh, but I also knew what they could do. So it's, you know, I bring in, I'm like, hey Mark, listen to this song, two bars into it, listen to this solo, and he goes, oh yeah, John. Oh yeah, we're doing this one. We're doing this one. What was difficult was when you play the same song with three different bands, and with each different band you have a different harmony part because of the, 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 the gifts of each of the, the singers in all the bands. Sometimes you end up with the high part, sometimes you end up with the low part, sometimes you end up with something in the middle. So you start playing this thing and I gotta look around and who am I playing with before I can sing? Just, you, know, you gotta keep it all straight in your head. We tried some Zeppelin, light Zeppelin. Some of them may have been my in incapacity to do a Zeppelin song too, so as much as I wanted to do it, it could have been my own limitations. But there wasn't anything that was a deal breaker. But you know, as I progressed, um, and got more familiar with the music and what my voice could do, I got to a point where it was like, I'm pretty comfortable. Um, I talked about being able to veto songs. I'm like, well, you know what? If, you, if we don't lower the key of the song, I'm gonna have to veto it because there's no way I can hit that note. <laughs> there's no way. Um, so the songs, obviously, I would bring them would be the ones that I could, I could sing along with in my car as I'm driving to work. It's just like, I know I can do this in this particular key. Or come in and say, hey, we gotta drop this a few octaves, but what do you guys think? Um, so, um, they were, uh, the, uh, again, great, great group of guys, you know, and, and they were very forgiving uh, with, with me uh, when I did have struggles. And there, it's just like, you know, they, they would say, you know, and, hey, hey, John, I know you can do this, we'll drop it. Um, I'll back you up on this part, you know, so, uh, again, great friends. Most of the bands I'd been in, I think I, I was one of the original members and we'd just start saying, hey, let's, what songs do we want to do? Let's, let's get a list together and we'll all go off and learn these on our own and come back and put them together. So, you know, we'd use recordings and we'd listen to it. And most of the time we tried to get close to what they were doing. But in this case, I, I just, for whatever reason, I think I just never, well, we didn't have things like uh, Spotify and, and even Napster really to, to download music and listen to it as easily as you can nowadays, right? So I didn't have any way to put a, a listen list together. So I just said, oh, hell with it. I'll just make it up as we go along. And, uh, and, and I enjoyed that. When you, when you pick up a new song, a new song, new cover song, um, it's, it's exciting, it's fun to play. Uh, and it shows, it shows. You know, the band's having fun with it and everything, but uh, you do it year after year after year. After a while, it, it takes a lot of energy to remain looking like you're excited <laughs> about the song. And we did some switch around instrumentation. I picked up an acoustic guitar and blended that in instead of electric a number of times. And that would that would give us an old song new life. Um, but I can't think of one that we just outright said, this just isn't ever going to work. It was just so much easier to, to do cover copy stuff. So. Um, we did, you know, in all that time we got at least one original down. Yeah, we had a couple of original songs. Um, uh, mostly born uh, out of uh, both Fred and Mark, because they, they were definitely uh, the musical talent uh, of the group. Uh, as, as was Ron, but um, both Fred and, and, and Mark had the, the vision of where they want to where they would want to go. And we actually recorded that song. It was the only original, and I think we actually even played it. But you know, it's a lot of work. I'm pretty self-critical, um, particularly about lyrics. And you know, the stuff that I wrote was crap, and I realized this could be a very, very long road for me. <laughs> so I'm not gonna push myself to do that. It was more 
the, the next, the next level, the next level. I mean, Fred was definitely um, uh, wanted to go uh, more professional than we already were. Um, uh, find an agent. Um, you know, he's, yeah, it, it depends on and what time of day it was and who you were talking to. It's just you know, like I said, you know, Mark and Fred put together a few originals that were good. I'll be honest, they weren't great. Um, but uh, the talent would have been there um, had had somebody uh, had the vision and you know had the had the music and the, the the melody in their heads and everything and you know there's a few times like I said that they, they, they were great they were ours um, but uh, they didn't last too long it was just easier to cover stuff and probably more popular for going out and playing events to, to have what kind of songs you guys play. All originals, like, all right, next. Usually summer was the, the big season because lots of people were doing outdoor events. But we were never out much. Um, I think that we played maybe five to six gigs a year. I know that Kurt Crosby, when he got into another band that he was in, would go out and as a bass player, he could play five nights a week. And he did for a certain point, but it burned him out. I would like to say that that's why, you know, we didn't want to play any, more, play any more than that, but the truth is it was really hard to, to book gigs. Somebody had to go out and do all of that marketing legwork, and it was just not anything that any of us really ever did well, right? We loved to play. As it turns out, we had enough friends and people that we knew that would bring their friends that we'd pretty much go play anything and have people that we knew showing up. You know, the, my favorite show every year was usually the uh, 4th of July uh, out at the Fountain's house. You know, those were always fun. And uh, uh, John and, and your dad always came up with some amazing, crazy uh, firework display or some, some, some new way to present the, the same fireworks that we saw every year you know we did a lot of these charity events these, these cancer walk relay for life kind of walk things and and uh, those were always fun because a it's a, it's a great cause uh, but B you kind of have a built-in large crowd you have a very large crowd um, we didn't play a whole lot of clubs and bars that I can remember um, a lot of what we did were more the, the events, outdoor events, private things. We did a lot of block parties, house parties, birthday parties for friends and things like that. We would typically do between 10 and 12 songs a set, four sets, um, with breaks in between. So you had to have 40 songs pretty well ready to go. Um, but I think that if you look, John had, and I don't know, you may have seen it, he had what he called the Bible. And this was cheat lyrics that he had in a book that was this big. I would say there were probably 200, 250 songs in there that if we said, all right, here's the set, 40 that we could do, um, we had 200 to choose from that we had done at some point or another. And that, uh, that was always funny. And the funny thing is that John would come into the gig, right, we'd do the sound check, you know, we would have put the set list together, so we'd tape that to the floor, and then he'd set his Bible right there at his feet. He never opened it, but it was like a security blanket. He had to have it in front of him, always had to have it there. And uh, I think there was one gig where he forgot it, and he was kind of a mess. <laughs> I wouldn't say anything pre-show ritual other than just plugging everything in, maybe a, a collective prayer that it all works. Usually we were spending all of our time trying to get the sound right. You know, that's in every venue, that is a big endeavor. Um, sometimes you're outdoors, sometimes you're indoors. Uh, sometimes you can hear yourself well, sometimes you can't, you get feedback. It's hard to get into just the music when you're still working through the mechanics of getting the sound right. As a guy who's played literally thousands of shows in my life, it's, it's almost never that you plug everything in, turn all the switches on, and everything just comes up and works exactly like you expect it to. That is such a rare event 
you, you can't even believe it if, if, if you don't do shows yourself. <laughs> what I loved the most was that Fred and I caught each other's rhythm. So in any given night, depending on what mood either of us was in, the other one was always picking up on it. And that's where the magic happened. We almost always would work in with, uh, it was a song called Babylon. And the nice thing about Babylon is we would, we would start with uh, Fred's riff and John's voice and the drums, and we would work the instruments in over time. And I'm pushing through the crowd, all those chemicals all rushing through my bloodstream. Only wishing you were here, you know I'm seeing it all so clear, I've been afraid. To tell you how I really feel, admit to some of those bad mistakes I've made. That ritual got us listening and blending right out of the shoot. Um, so that that always, I mean, there were times we did other things, but that was always the successful, all right, let's get into our groove. Babylon got us started well. Gosh, just thinking back, you know, we played a lot of a variety of songs that were great, Jim Blossoms and all that, but the one that just stands out for me is Mysterious Ways. Uh, we ended, I think, every gig with uh, Henry Lee Summers, Wish I Had a Girl Like That. I freaking love that song. I thought we did that song so well, and, and it was just every time, there were some times, you know, you'd be playing, and next thing you know, oh, it's almost the end of the night, and every time they would call that song, it's like, yes, that's my song. 
every gig we did, we ended with that song. Because it was always tight, it's a great high energy song, it's a great thing to close on, and the song always trashes John's voice. So after that, there's nothing left. All right, we'll just plan it for that. So, you know, that was one of the, one, one of the, one of the big ones. Before we did uh, Seven Bridges Road, we had what we called the Circle of Fear. And we all stood around and dialed up our, our uh, vocal parts because it, it was a cappella, like five part, ridiculous harmony. That was always something we had to practice. Um, and it's funny because the Eagles, when they would perform it, and John told me about this, the Eagles, when they performed it, would always come out and do what they called the circle of fear. If you're doing an a cappella song with, you know, four to five harmonies in it, you can't go in apologetic. You have to go in. Even if you're wrong, you have to go all in. Um, and that's what that song, you know, did for us, is it would get us all in. One, two, three. There are stars <laughs> in the sun. So it was a great inspirational song, but it was also a song you had to sing somewhere in the, about midway through the gig because you, you still had to have a pretty fresh voice to pull it off. And I have tried doing it with other bands, but it's, it, was, it was never the same as with those guys. Uh, we just got better and better and we got more and more gigs. And then um, uh, Mark uh, had a few obligations and he, he, he said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave, leave the band. I think probably the worst thing is I got wrapped around my own axle. Uh, it got frustrated. 
um, and I took a year off of the band. Um, and I just, I'd been doing it for a long time and I just kept thinking I'm really, really frustrated. I'm not musically getting what I want. You know, this is the classic, band does well, somebody gets an ego, somebody does something stupid, checks out for a while. I checked out for a year. So at that point, uh, we're then in the market for another guitar player and uh, found, um, I can't even remember the guy's name, uh, because once we, I can't remember the guy's name. Anyway, he came in, he was, a, he was a singer and he played keyboards as well, right? But he was also kind of an ass. Um, so uh, it, it came very obvious at that point that uh, you know we, we had something special. So we went about six months with this guy. And uh, I happened to get a call from John and uh, it was a year later. And uh, I said, hey, you know what, this isn't working out. Would you have any interest in coming back? And he goes, man, I have to say, I do miss it. He came back and uh, we picked up pretty much where we left off. That was uh, not a dark year, but it was uh, a lonely year because it wasn't just missing the music, it was missing the camaraderie. Um, and it got nothing but better from there. Hey, when you give this car back to your grandpa, let him know uh, it's got a tail light out. <laughs> oh, does it really? <laughs> I know it's got a headlight out. I got a, the replacement. Actually, I've got replacements for each one of them in, inside the car. I, I was going to fix those before I drove home drunk from Jones. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> when the band was fairly young, we recorded five songs in a studio in Hayward um, that we needed because we needed to get a demo that we could put in front of a bar owner and say, here's, here's five minutes, right? So we would blend pieces of five songs into it to give the, the, them a taste. Um, but we went back in later uh, when John, at that point, had moved out to Ripon. Uh, it was during one of the, the holiday dinners I was talking about where Mark brought up, he goes, hey, I got a gift for the band. Um, and it, I believe it was four hours at this recording studio over in Modesto. Um, and he goes, I, I've searched around, this guy's really good, has a... As the uh, both the equipment and the and the software we're looking for, uh, I heard some of his demo tapes. It's, it's a good deal. You know that cost a fair amount of money. It's in those days was nowhere like where where it is today. Where you can go out and for a thousand dollars you've got everything that you need to do your own recording in your own bedroom, mix it down the whole routine. As with any gig, you know we had a, a lot of rehearsals beforehand. Um, we met, we decided, we picked choose the songs that were were most popular. Uh, because, <coughs> excuse me, because I thought with the band was, would this be, this would be our, our, our demo. Uh, you know, you throw somebody a CD, a bar owner or something, and this is us, let me, give me, give me a call. You know, this was pre, and it wasn't that long ago, but it was pre-Facebook and pre, you know, where you could upload digital stuff and just have it online. So I don't recall, but I don't listen to it enough. I hear it in my head, <laughs> all the other voices. <laughs> the band had a basically an account where all the, the money from the gigs would go into and everything we agreed as a, as a band. It's just like, okay, let's double that, let's, let's make it eight. Um, and then I said it was two days because we couldn't finish what we needed to do in eight hours. Uh, so, so then we went two days. That was, that was such a great experience because it was, the engineer was good and he was able to take and put us in a room together and let us do what we do well, which is play off of each other. You know, the, the idea of taking instruments and isolating them in a sound studio so that they all are in the, it's not very effective, but when you get a group of guys like us who were cut our teeth on playing live, we really needed to be around each other. And uh, this guy understood that, and he picked up the chemistry that happened as a result of it. And we captured, I think, a lot of that. And then we went back into the booth and did, did individual vocal parts um, to, to make sure that we had, were either doubling a voice or we were getting the harmonies right. There was one point in that session where we would, all four of us were around a microphone singing, you know, four-part harmonies. Um, and that was, that was pretty magical. So of the two demo tapes, I think that ended up being the one that was much better. Our band got together 
for This is Fred. Hey Frank, how you doing? Pleased to meet you. Yeah, great. Come in. How you doing? I'm Neil. I'm, I'm the videographer. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I know. See, Friday nights, we'll stay up late on Friday nights, usually. Oh, and, okay. I, and I never usually open until 10, 30, or 11. So that's, that's why so, I am. Uh, <laughs> let alone 9. I go late on 9 on a Saturday, I don't even get up until 9.30 on a weekday. <laughs> All right. Frank, this is George. Hi, George. Hi, how are you? Oh, go that way if you're right. a young guy. Yep. I think I was a bit nervous because studio, you can't hide. Right, like when we're gigging live, there's echo, and you know somebody may not pick up, and you know there may be a delay. Um, but in the studio, it's like you're on, the mics are on you, and, and you pick up every miss or every hit. There's another. There's two more of these boom arms for cymbals. There's one. Yeah, I just need uh, one more. There's one right there. Get down there and back in the fan. If you get warm, then just turn that little fan this, on. This little guy here? Yeah, try not to use the, the fastest speed because it makes too much noise. No, I probably won't need it. Or you never know. Okay. He's got a LP. With a, a uh, pretty fancy oh. bridge. A squire. Oh, that's it's a tailor in the center, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all two thousand dollar bass creep. I thought you were a guitar player. I thought you. If well, you, he can play guitar I too. Cook into a guitar riff. I thought that was more. I didn't see the bass thing on it. No, we'll, we'll see what it sounds like. It'll either be cool or. The only thing I didn't like about it was after. I got home and started listening to it. The way the guy that recorded the bass, it was, it was, I mean, it was a, it was a fat tone, but it was like too fat. It was, it was rumbly and, 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 and it's not the tone I, I, I reach for when I'm playing live. I brought my uh, little pod, my bass pod that I was using at the time, which they're made for like recording. Oh no, you don't want that. I've got this thing here. And <laughs> I'm a bass player and this is what I use when I record well okay you know you're, you're the engineer you're the recording guy you're a bass player too I'm not gonna argue and and in the cans it sounded fat sounded good so I'm like yeah uh, and then later on when you know I heard the finished recording I, that's my only complaint about the whole recording is the tone of the bass being kind of fat and 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 soft, but the process was a blast. Or, uh, okay. Yeah, you, know, you have a choice. You can either use that, and in two seconds I'll show you what mine sounds like. Sure. And then you go. I want two guitar channels. Uh, stereo, yes. Okay, I think I got a strip nut here. Uh oh. You want to... Now, they're, actually, they're, can you grab me one of those nuts? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Try that one, trade you. Uh, it's got to be one? the uh, like quarter this coin. This one? Yeah. Need strips. Need a wrench? Uh, I'm wondering if there's a bolt strip, too. Looks like the bolt strip down a little bit. Uh, let's see. Nope. We're, we're, we're toast. Yeah. Okay, well, Looks me... like it. Oh, I got it. But there's a lot more. All right. Everybody's trying to get their, their stuff perfectly right, note for note. And you'll do a, a take where everybody had a mistake or two in there and it's like, okay, yeah, shake that one off, let's do it again. And after two or three of those, you usually get to a point where at least two of the guys were like, ah, I don't know, I thought my part was pretty good. And at that point, you generally wanna sit on that and then just start punching in your little mistakes and errors and stuff like that.
typical again. Or I, don't, I don't like this. It's too dirty for me. Take it off your lead channel. Yeah. Just keep it like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that better. Yeah. And, and no, the lead's actually going to be a, a Rick, clean Rick, six string with that little ring. Okay. So it's all gonna be really clean. Good, I didn't like that sound. And what exactly are you here for, sir? Yeah, just taking up room. <laughs> Breathing up air? Breathing up air. <laughs> Breathing up air that the band needs? The band needs the air. They're making music over there. Yes, George has a swine flu, so we've, uh, Quarantined him Again? in the glass room. Trying to play uh, independently, isolated from the real live inner dynamic of a live jam, so there could have been a delay there. But that was my biggest challenge. Oh. It's Dick and Harry's looking for now. Okay, hit the kick again. Hit it, hit it the way you're going to be playing it. Okay, Tom one, Tom two, Wait. stay on two, keep hitting it, hit it. Floor Tom. That's what it should sound like. Play the whole kit like you're playing one of the songs you're going to play one of the songs you're going to record. hours from now, yeah, right, right. no one's going to know where one is. Yep. I mean, they'll know where one is, but they're not going to hear this. There's not going to be a tempo. So the question, so on something like this, do your intro, then they sing, but you don't stop clicking. Okay? We'll erase that. We'll erase your yeah. stick clicks later. And trust me, two hours from now when they start doing singing, they're going to be real happy that those little clicks are there. Yep. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Let me hit the red button. I want to tell you
to do it and balance out the sound. Yep. I want to be on top this time. <laughs> <laughs> Said change positions. The, the funny thing is, um, uh, there's a song on there, the Brian Adams song. Um, it was the day before the recording or the day of the recording where we were just messing around and Mark said, Hey, let's do this song. This is actually one of the newer ones we just picked up, uh, and that's how that ended up on there. And it was, I think that was probably the quickest uh, part of the session because we had it in one or two takes. She got the brains. She got the looks. She knows all the right people read all the right books. Sometimes wonder She's a little too good for me She's gonna change me if I
what I enjoy about the recording process is they say, okay, uh, do something, you know, to let's, let's make this more interesting. And now you get everybody giving you input and ideas of what you can do here or what you can do there. And you drop that in. And by the time you, you've done it enough times to get a good take in the recording studio, it, it gets locked in, it gets burned in. So then when you're playing live, you can drop those cool things in that you picked up in the studio because you wanted to, to, to spice it up a bit. Yeah, that's fun. I met you before the fall of Rome And I begged you to let me take you home You were wrong, I was right much more fun you go your way I'll go mine and I'll see you next time it's all been done it's all been done it's all been done before and if I put my fingers here and if I say Nicely done, boys. Nicely done. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. I faked the whole thing. I never uttered a sound. <laughs> just move my mouth. <laughs> yeah, you could. You don't have to, just as long as it's cleared harmonies. You know, three. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Somebody told me originally that you've been together for a real long time, you practice all the time, you go play shows. I go, okay, it's going to be too simple. And they're all middle aged, meaning you've been playing forever. So it's, yeah. so it's going to be cool. Yeah. It's gonna be, it'll be just like what you just experienced. Right, right. <laughs> That'd be great. I'm going to put this back up for you. Where? Wait till you hear this, guys. Yeah. You're blown away. Because I'm not importing all of this stuff into Pro, Pro, Pro Tools, so it's in Pro Tools all by itself. We can do that, but it takes about an hour and a half a song to right. mix that way. Right. <clears throat> this sounds great now. The it's reason why it does is because the stringed instrument, you know, bands that are all guitar, you know, no horns and, you know, but just all guitar, rocky sounding stuff, does sound better analog. We always record everything, no matter if it stays here or goes over there, it's all recorded this analog way, and then we import in. <clears throat> in the case of this band, and to do this quickly, to make it not be one and a half hours per song to mix because we're importing and building a mixer and taking for you know, it takes, I don't know if you've ever watched that, but it's not quick, yeah. but it comes out fucking killer. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 It's not fucking killer. Yeah. But this will make it sound real killer too because I'm going to, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a bunch of the drums over here and all of the vocals. I'm going to give it Pro Tools plug-in right. power, exactly. and then and then it feeds right back into. So in other words, we're running He's both computers. Using like we're running both computers like an outboard effect. Yes, we're using it as a rack of outboard right, devices, right. which are going to yeah. be SSL channels and, Sweet. and Cherry's vocal pitch correctors. So we're going to get the best of both worlds. Right. But we can't automate. It's not going to memorize it because this memorize. You know, if we we're going to do automation mixes in here, then it would memorize it every time. That only takes an extra couple of hours. You know, real mixes in Pro Tools. You know, when we do real records, they'll spend five to eight hours to mix one song. Yeah. But it's for you know famous people or people that have you know twenty thousand dollar budget for their record type thing. Sometimes wonder she's a little too good for me. AC30 doing that. Okay. Yeah. All right. He is not my mind. Oh. Nice. Just, just go, Johnny. Let's go. I want to tell. No, I was just showing him. Usually, say, wow, rock guys don't suck. don't like. Yeah, it. disco like Johnny, rock man. <laughs> rock guys don't want to sound like Cher singing. Do you believe in magic? What did yeah, exactly. I say outside? Yeah. Okay. I didn't yeah. want it sounding like Cher. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's T Pain, you guys. Uh, Cher, that's right. Yeah. Cher started it. I want to tell. Yeah. It's like, wow. Yep. A little bit of vocal clean. Right here. To let me take you home. Get rid of the grunt.
Okay, so right. you, did, you wanted it all the way to the end? Yeah, yeah. that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. You don't want me to like do a guitar solo over the end of that solo? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll put one on real fast. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do it. Some bands will go, yeah, yeah, do it. You know, and other bands they do what you did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's how long it takes for you guys to do three songs. Wow. Not bad. Not bad at all. Four hours, three songs, man. That's impressive. That's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> it takes longer to get set up. It takes the, the length of a time to record a whole song as it does to just get set up and start playing. Right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> If you got somebody coming in, 30, not till what, 35 minutes. Yeah, we should probably clean our stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The yeah, drums and. Oh, yeah. okay. Cool. And gonna... So, boys, what did you think? Well, you know, it was a hard trip. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure Tina pays you when we get to the house. Not a problem. Did you get how many CDs did he give you? He's giving you one for everybody. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He is. Yeah. He is? Oh, that's yeah, burning your five. Mark, do you have anything else to go in my trunk? No. No. But if you can whistle too, I'm more than going to go there. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. What are they no, shooting? No, we all have to come up. So we got. Yeah, see, that's easy. Go down here and somebody can hear you. Oh, yeah, right there. That's it. Yeah. What is I'm this? Saying. Thank you. We're having such a great time doing it. Wow. One of us has the original tapes from those demos. So I don't know if it was me, Mark. I don't think I have them. Either Mark or John may still have those original reel to reel. Yeah. So yeah, we did we did make a push to, to do a second round. As I think most bands do. Well, we all wanted to go back. Once we got that the the recording and we were like Hey, you know, that sounds pretty good. Uh, of course, we wanted to go back and, and do more stuff. The trouble with it is that if you do that, you are, now you're going to have to start paying royalties because we're doing all covers. I think the push was to do maybe more current and updated. So if, if we did one and it was, was four or five years and our music changed and maybe the recording got outdated. Honestly, I don't think we were disciplined enough to pull out. The guy that was really disciplined was Ron because he had recorded before with some of his other bands. and. For example, he's he's got a sense of timing that is just metronomish. Well, it's because before they recorded with his uh, with his earlier band, they all played together with a metronome for a month, and it got them all synced. I mean, they all learned how to do it. But being together on time when you're being recorded is critical, and when you're not, it's messy and it just does not sound good. So, I don't think that we ever really developed that discipline. I would have taken a little bit of the fun out of it too. What I did was when I when we got the recordings I burned them onto my computer and I integrate them into my various playlists that I listen to so I never really kind of go oh hey I'm gonna go listen to those songs we recorded with the Pulse but I get these nice little you know it'll pop up one of them will pop up you know in my playlist every so often and it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, you riding in a car with somebody? Hey, this is my band. <laughs> it was a great experience, um, uh, but a grind, but a grind. It's, yeah, you, you know, you hear about, you know, the, the studio time, it's, it's certainly not glamorous. It's a lot of stops and starts and I drop that and I gotta go back and, um, yeah, but I, I like the finished product. I have so many memories of how it was made and what it was like to make it with them. You know, it's, it, it's an okay recording, but it's a remarkable set of memories. When I moved down here, I didn't pick up the instrument for a year. It was too painful. I just so missed the pulse that the music just basically left me. And uh, 
And then I picked it up and Joy and I started singing together and we were, had been looking for a church down here. We found a church, they had a band. So we got involved with them. Um, and I, they already had plenty of instrumentalists, so I did nothing but sing. And I, which really taught me a lot about how to sing because that's all I would do. But Joy was singing with me, so we were all singing harmonies for the most part. Um, and now that's been, what is this? about 11 years with that with that church playing. And we run it. I mean, the, the, my closest friend here is the other guitar player. Joy is one of the lead singers, and uh, we play every Sunday. It's really fun. And they're good musicians, and again, it's another close band of friends. So that works well. Um, it's been a nice add-on uh, after a year of missing my bandmates. Uh, from Northern California. It, it, denying the music when it's in you just never works. It may take a little while to get it back, but it, you can't ever deny it. You know, once once he decided to move, you know, we said, hey, let's let's still try to get together at least once in a while, and we did. Um, but you know, we just we just kind of spread apart after that. We all knew we'd still get together and play from time to time. But we also knew it, it, that was basically the end of, of the Poles as a, as a kind of a working band. With Mark being in Southern California, just makes it hard because we, because collectively here, most of us are here. But um, so that that's kind of just it has to be planned. To me, anything we did after that was was already a reunion, even if it was only you know three months after they moved down there. You know, because I mean, it's not like we're rehearsing every week or even every month or anything. You know, the only time we played was when we, either we went down there or he traveled up here. That was difficult for Fred. That was very difficult for Fred. And he uh, um, kept reaching out to folks and letting, you know, letting them know, hey, we, we should get together and still gig and everything. And, uh, you know, after a while, you know, with you know, people responding with, you know, I, I can't this weekend, I've got a vacations, they're not responding at all. I think he, he got he got the message, and um, you know, and then after his passing, you know, people just kind of spread off. The hardest thing was when Fred died. That was such a heartbreak because he was such a critical part of who we were, and we tried playing without him uh, once or twice, and it just it was never the same. That magic was just never the same. Uh, we still sometimes get together and and can play and mess around, but. Fred has always missed. I miss making music with him, and, and uh, he was an interesting dude. <laughs> Fred Rouse was great. He was kind of an anchor of the band, uh, lead guitarist, phenomenal, you know, really talented. Fred was brilliant in his own right outside of the band, but his sense of humor just uh, was always was was always you know a laugh. You know, some of the stories he had just. You know, some of them were just like, oh yeah, that's totally Fred. Other times it was like, what? <laughs> and I do think about Fred, you know, when I, when I see pictures of the group or I think about, reflect back on the Pulse and that he's not with us anymore. You know, just, you know, those are the memories you keep with anybody that's part of your life that, you know, had an impact on it. And uh, you can still hear him laughing, you can still hear him jousting and, um, so yeah, greatly missed, and uh, would have been great to have him around for a for a reunion. But if we do do that, you know, it would be, you know, obviously for him and, and his memory. So, Fred Rouse was uh, one of the one of the greatest guitar influences for me because he really made me learn to listen and blend, and not just be, you know, this solo thing. And that was true of the whole band. We sort of grew up as a band learning how to not stomp all over each other and actually serve the song as opposed to serving our instruments and our own egos. It's, it's, it's really sad. Fred went way too young and he had so much, so much talent, you know, and, but he never stopped talking about getting back together. Any band who's lost a key member is not the same, but you go on, you know, in their memory and you do it for old time's sake and for fun. And, you know, if they were around, they'd probably say, no, you guys should should jam, you know. You can't think of the Pulse without thinking about Fred. Obviously, the rest of us are all here, and you know, we pick up the phone and almost all get together. 
for my uh, 60th birthday last March, my wife got uh, the remaining uh, members of the band together on a Zoom call. So we chatted for about an hour. Uh, and it, it yeah, the, the Pulse will never, will, will never be the Pulse again without Fred. Um, did we talk about getting together and, and making music? Yeah, yeah we did, you know, but uh, there'll definitely be a vacuum there. I've got a picture that is fading of uh, a gig that we did at one of the wineries in Livermore. And I think it was just before my 50th birthday. And somebody took a, a, a picture of the band, the wives, all together. Um, and you can see in that picture how much everybody enjoyed being around each other. So for all the music, um, that was fantastic, but the thing that really locked the band in was, was its family nature and how much we really enjoyed each other. And at age 62 now, I look back and say, I'm an okay guitar player, but I'm a great friend with those people, and I'll take that any day of the week. You know, I've been in a lot of groups, none of them ever really stuck it out like, like the pulse. I mean, we and we didn't stick it out. It wasn't like it was. It wasn't sticking it out. But I mean, we stuck together for a very long time. And I think that just says something about who we were and, and with each other. Geez, we were together 20 plus years, uh, and uh, the, the way it all pulled together is it, it just a bunch of nice guys who were who happened to be very talented musicians, except for the singer. <laughs> My time in the band, I think about all the time. In fact, in the other people, with the other people, the other bands that I'm in now, uh, I have to just quit talking about the Pulse years. It's like, all right, we've heard it all, shut up. Um, there isn't a day that I don't think of those guys and those times. And, I, you know, it's, it's better now, but I used to think of Fred every day. Um, and. You know, it's a little bit better. It's once a week now, but occasionally Facebook memories will pop up and there he is and it's like, oh man. It's sad, but the sadness has waned and now it's just the sweet memories. And we were always, always there to, to prop each other up and support each other whenever we needed it. I needed a lot of that at that time. We were going through all kinds of stuff and I was uh, struggling. And uh, these guys were a great, great uh, source of, of support for me. They were the best friends in the world. They would drop anything, go anywhere, do anything you needed, uh, if you needed help. We, uh, again, a great group of friends who happened to play music. It was a lot of mischief. It was always fun. Um, it was often outrageous. We had a great group of people that came to hear us. So it was always fun to go out and play. It was my first formal band, you know, for a long time. And these guys, you know, we saw kids being raised and born and, <laughs> you know, the trials and tribulations. And uh, it was just a great run when it lasted. That was a big part of my life for a very long time. So, and I, to this day, miss those guys painfully. The two longest bands I ever played in were Outrider and The Pulse and those were both about 12 years each. Uh, and then most of the other bands, you know, three or four years, two or three here, three or four, four or five, some of them. It, it's been a hell of a journey. <laughs> and it's still going for me. I mean, everybody is playing music still. Um, you know, I, I play with my, both my sons in, in, our, in our garage. Uh, George plays with a band called The Hurricane. I'm playing uh, this Sunday with uh, the Hurricane Band, George's band. I'm playing Sunday. I'm playing a show with George. And George is going to move to uh, Reno. Uh, so he's leaving the band. And then my another drummer that I play with, with, with a couple other different projects, he's going to be stepping in and covering George in that band for a while. So, um, you know, so. I'll be playing one last show with George on Sunday. Ron is playing bass with a couple bands. One's called uh, Sold Out, S-O-U-L-E-D, Sold Out. 
just playing all the time with as many different people as I can, as often as I can. And then uh, Mark plays with uh, both church groups and uh, um, has a few guys get together as, as well down there. So everybody's still doing the thing. I mean, if we all got together uh, tomorrow, would it be rusty? Yeah, yeah. But I think we could still do it. We could still do it. Even as old as we are. <laughs>